uh, apparently. Okay, are we good now? Okay, uh, so after that slightly rough start, thank you so much for your patience. Uh, this talk is an interdisciplinary exploration of the cognitive dimensions of embodied skilled practices, focusing on capabilities that involve the training and refinement of multimodal sensory motor capacities, the use of tools, instruments, and spaces structured to pragmatically and cognitively support such specialized practices. I include in this gamut precision machine operation, clinical diagnosis, laboratory experimentation, body therapies, musicianship, sports, as well as crafts, arts, and artisanal practices. Here I focus more on individual interactions than on uh, with tools and spaces than on social interaction, although in fact most of this talk is rather theoretical. I argue for the cognitive richness of such practices and aim to revalorize them. My goal is to encourage a reconsideration of some of the conceptual categories we customarily deploy in thinking about these things in order to gain a more coherent, holistic comprehension of ourselves as creatures functioning as skilled performers. The theoretical questions explored here are grounded in and arise from a lifetime of making practice. I'm a sculptor, sailor, boat builder, metal worker, blacksmith, roboticist, and gardener, as well as a lifelong practitioner, a teacher and theorist in the arts and digital cultures. The foundations of this research began, I now understand, in my inchoate uh, attempts as a young practitioner to develop custom computational interactive technologies that traded in the sensory motoric immediacy of embodied experience. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I discovered that I was uh, uh, at odds with the uh, ethos of computing. Although my background is in the plastic arts, I'm not here foregrounding questions of art as it is discussed in contemporary art theory, nor directly questions of creativity. We're all skilled practitioners of embodied and situated practices. We play football, we make and do, we cycle, uh, sail, we cook, we play musical instruments, and so on. Skilled practitioners attest that in their experience of skilled practices, Intelligence feels like it is happening in peripersonal space at the fingertips on the workbench in structured workspaces. As an inquiring practitioner, I seek to reconcile these experiences with academic approaches to intelligence or cognition that emphasizes abstraction and perhaps devalorizes embodied practices. This paper begins by asking why philosophically do we separate skill and intelligence? I'll argue that we should think of skilled embodied practices as intelligence proper, not the material effects of abstract intelligence. As Gilbert Ryle famously observed, overt intelligent performances are not clues to the workings of minds, they are those workings. And he also said, thinking what I'm doing does not connote both thinking what I'm doing and doing it. When I do something intelligently, i.e. thinking what I am doing, I am doing one thing and not two. My performance has special procedure or manner, not special antecedents. Skill is not then the dexterous actions of the meat robot driven by a computer brain. According to an inactive conception of cognition, cognition involves ongoing iterative food lo feedback loops among mind, body, and world. A key term in inactive cognition is sensory motor. All action is sensing and all sensing is action. This destabilizes the linear serial conception of sensing, cognition, and action as reified in the von Neumann, the architecture of the von Neumann machine. Likewise, dogmatic distinctions between sensing, perception, and cognition are destabilized. My position is informed by, shall we say, post-cognitivist theories of cognition that will be familiar to many of you that have arisen over the last 30 years, sometimes called 4E or 
I use the acronym SEED, situated, embodied, inactive, and distributed. These positions hold variously that cognition is not or not exclusively mentalist or internalist happening in the brain, but is whole bodily or whole bodily and extends into the world. They also hold variously that cognition is not computational or representational, that it is not a matter of reasoning on symbols. If skill and intelligence are not separate, but overlapping concepts, if embodied practices are taken to constitute intelligence, this has ramifications for general conceptualizations of intelligence. Hello. It had to happen, I suppose. Right. Um, embodiment and materiality really matter in questions of cognition, scale, distance, effort, mass, balance, texture, friction, hardness, odor, are variables to think with in the real world cognitive laboratory. They do not just inform cognition, I assert, but are components in the process of cognition. David, 90s, we offer actions in the world not for pragmatic reasons, but for epistemic purposes to learn things. We do things with artifacts and tools that either facilitate cognition or permit kinds of cognition that we unaided are incapable of. An active artisanal and embodied practices should be understood as intelligence proper in action. And conversely, intelligence must be seen as a temporarily developing process as performance in Andy Pickering's terms. Uh, Andy Pickering, sociologist of science and formerly physicist, proposed a useful ontological distinction. He suggested that formalized science operates in what he called the representational idiom, the organization, organization of data into arguments, all residing in a alphanumeric milieu. But he argued actual experimental work in the laboratory operates in the performative idiom and was char is characterized by what he recalled a dance of agency between humans, instruments, and materials. This idea has deep sympathies, you'll recognize, with the inactive paradigm and also with the, the non-human exceptionalist act actor network theory of Latour, Calon, and Law. Anthropologist Tim Ingold criticizes what he calls the hylomorphic model of creativity. Now, there are some who would contest his use of the Aristotelian terminology. I am not a scholar of classical philosophy, so it's not a fight that I uh, want to engage in. But to deploy his use of the term hylomorphic, his general point is that accepted philo philosophical arguments uh, holds that Creative acts must necessarily be preceded by a creative idea. This is a temporal elaboration of Cartesian dualism. Such creative ideas are often regarded as being realized in specifications we call plans, as paradigmatically in architecture or engineering design, or as an example in musical scores. And perhaps the most extreme case of hylomorphism in this sense is computer code. Ingold's hylomorphism is clearly in tension with approaches that recognize situated inactive improvisation or bricolage in sports, in musicianship, and in crafts. Skill, enacted amongst tools and materials in cognitive ecologies, is as much improvisation as it is hylomorphism. In improvisation, in taking a shot at goal, or approximating a given intention with the available tools and materials, one senses affordances. In scenarios, far more often than one realizes a pre-drawn plan. And as Dwight, hello, as Dwight Eisenhower amusingly opined, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. In his charming essay, Walking the Plank, Ingold shows that sawing a plank with a handsaw 
a purportedly repetitive process for a fully engaged worker, every stroke is different. One is always subtly adjusting for changing circumstances. One notices the hardness and the darkness of the knot as one encounters it with the saw and applies slightly increased force, noticing as one does the way the saw teeth skid over the harder wood, making a higher pitched sound as the fragrance of the pine resin rises more concentrated in the knot. Now, I want to move now to talk about screen interaction for, for, for a little while. If, as argued above, embodiment and materiality really matter in questions of cognition, then variations in the material realizations and contexts of experiences has real impact on cognition per se. This brings into, a, into question a range of what I regard as rather lazy assumptions regarding screen-based online learning and online research that became predominant in the pandemic period and we should remember, have been enormously profitable for many internet-based companies. The burden is on such purveyors and researchers to establish that, for instance, moving a token on a screen via a pointing device is cognitively equivalent in relevant ways to moving a physical object on a table with the hand. This is basic semiotics. René Magritte's warning is more relevant now than ever. With interaction come more complex problems. While a picture of a pipe is not a pipe, is manually moving a picture of a pipe moving a pipe? Uh, screener learning is learning within the regime of the representational in Pickering's sense. Unlike a hike in the woods, everything in, say, an interactive video of a hike in the woods has been designed in, and all possibilities for action are predetermined. They are, those, these environments are sensorially constrained, no smells, no textures, no peripheral vision. That is not to say that screen or pedagogical experiences have no value, nor that screen-based activities are not themselves embodied in particular ways but they are different, they're of a different ontological kind from experiences with physical artifacts, tools, and spaces. And I would contend that to, assume that to assume that they're equivalent is fallacious. This feels to me like an important issue for contemporary pedagogy. Now I'll turn to some remarks about AI to contextualize the following conversation. If intelligence or cognition is not taken to be reasoning on symbols in some abstract mental space, but is understood as successfully getting by as a creature with a specific set of sensory motor capabilities in its umwelt, then a basic assertion in the rhetoric of artificial intelligence that reasoning on symbols in a digital computational environment constitutes intelligence is put under some pressure. This, I hasten to add, does not detract from the evident capabilities of symbolic AI, neural networks, or machine learning, but just from the rhetorical claim. This is an old conversation going back at least to Hubert Dreyfus's phenomenological critique of computing in what computers can't do 50 years ago. There's a related matter of where the intelligence is located. Some of you may be familiar with John Searle's famous Chinese room argument against symbolic AI, to which Ed Hutchins responded with a distributed cognition response. He argued that although the person in the room does not know Chinese, the room as a system does. The power of contemporary AI is is dr draws from a vast data infrastructure. One could not operate relatively simple statistical operations on gargantuan volumes of data and get useful answers if the data were not already there. Machine learning works because it has access to a vast amount of raw material in the form of alphanumeric strings. 
Server farms are the mines, and the internet is the ship, are the shipping routes for machine learning. It's important to remember that for most of the history of symbolic AI, roughly from 1960 to 1990, data was input manually by typists. There was no internet. There were no data warehouses. And there's uh, an image of people inputting data at Volkswagen in 1973 to remind us. In the, in the late 1980s, symbolic AI collapsed due to the, quote, common sense problem. Closed logical systems could not manage the contingencies of the world or the quirks of human language. Machine learning evaded the common sense problem, excuse me, machine learning evades the common sense problem because people have already done the common sense work. I think this is a really a fundamental point in conversations about contemporary AI. As Umberto Maturana noted, everything said is said by an observer. The vast amount of data drawn on by machine learning has been put there and classified by people. And even now, vast armies of people are employed training machine learning systems. People are the sensory experience interface to the world, tagging photos and recommending burgers, crowdsourcing. They translate lived experience into alphanumeric strings. Machine learning does not experience the world. It calculates based on the alphanumeric residues of human experiences. Machine learning, like Soylent Green, is people. That is to say, artificial intelligence as we know it today is a cyborgian complex with human end effectors. So that kind of concludes my, my contextualizing remarks. Um, for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to talk uh, on one hand um, from a kind of philosophical perspective and, and from, uh, from a neuroscientific perspective. So this work on skill uh, is part of a larger book project. Here, I want to briefly uh, discuss a historical inquiry into the philosophical and linguistic frameworks within which we are accustomed to speak of skill. The second part is a, is a discussion of some of the aspects of the neurophysiology of skill. And I pursue these topics in an effort to build a non-dualist framework within which to consider skilled embodied practices as intelligence proper. Now, Terms like intelligence and cognition are notoriously difficult to define, more so general terms like consciousness, selfhood, and mind. And their definitions vary from discipline to discipline. They are necessarily rooted in usually implicit philosophical worldview. It's salutary to recall that the very concept of consciousness as we, now, as we know it is itself a modern invention unknown to the Greeks or medieval scholars. Now, my interdisciplinary study of skill qua cognition draws on perspectives from philosophy, psychology, anthropology, cognitive science, and neuroscience. And the territory where they intersect is a, is a conceptual minefield. One of the problems in cognitive science discourse is that we bring in axiomatically concepts from pre-scientific discourses, uh, particularly philosophy of mind. So um, the experience of skilled practices destabilizes the skill intelligent binary, I will assert. The skill intelligence binary is a scion of the mother of all binaries, Descartes' mind-body dualism. And this separation between skill and intelligence digs into the core of Western humanist philosophy. That is Descartes' infamous division of the person into two immiscible aspects, the res cogitans and the res extensa, a material doing part and an immaterial thinking part. In the Cartesian scenario, the two parts are not of the same order, not apples and oranges, but apples and jealousy. We all know experientially what it's like to have a body, but mind is an idea and perhaps an idea we would be better off without. Richard Rorty in his book, Philosophy and the Mirror of Nature 
builds an amusing thought experiment in which an alien race identical to modern humans, uh, uh, except that they have no concept of mind, but he demonstrates that they get on perfectly well without it. Therefore, in order to build a valid discourse on skill as cognition, as intelligent action, a critical review of such terminology seems necessary. This involves, amongst other things, this kind of historiographical deconstruction of the concept of mind. An array of contingent cultural and historical forces have led to the concept as we modern Westerners comprehend it, especially the way it is juxtaposed with the concept of body. To quote Ryle again, traditional theory of mind has misconstrued the type distinction between disposition and exercise into its mythical bifurcation of unwitnessable mental causes and their witnessable physical effects. So I think this idea has had a profoundly negative impact on Western philosophy and Western culture, and certainly it makes it very difficult to grapple with the kind of embodied notions that, that I'm attempting to work with. Now, substance dualists are these days rare, especially in scientific communities, but I will contend the idea persists implicitly um, in purported hierarchical relationships, the hardware, software, and information matter divisions in computer science being a case in point. Such binaries structure our discourses in ways that can be dubious or obfuscated. A framework that distinguishes higher and lower cognition and valorize, valorizes abstraction is due for interrogation. Much neuroscience research appears to tacitly replace the mind-body dualism with a brain-body dualism in which... So in terms of what neuroscience might tell us about skill as lived experience, sorry, in terms of what neuroscience might tell us about skill as lived experience, what's called for, I would say, it, is, is a non-dualist framework for a holistic neurophysiologically grounded theory of skill that does not covertly or tacitly replace mind with brain while preserving an hierarchical binary with respect to body. Our academic tradition is committed to a valorization of abstraction and symbolic representation, the production of generalized truths. The process by which this occurs is one of extraction and distillation, the representational idiom in which material specificity is winnowed out. Digital culture likewise emphasizes the possibility of disembodied information and as such minimizes the relevance of materiality. But, si but skill embodied practices generally are particular and specific. And in this way, both digital cultures and the culture of academia mit against a coherent understanding of skill, I will say. Now, I'll give a quick uh, overview of some of the key ideas that, that have informed my uh, analysis of skill as intelligence. Um, as you've noticed, I cite Ryle's ontological distinction between know-how and know-that. There's significant overlap between Ryle's terminology and Pickering's notion of the representational and performative idioms. Both these formulations distinguish between a getting by in the world kind of knowledge and knowledge captured in symbolic form. Dorothea Legrand's notion of pre-reflective awareness will, as you will see in the, in the conversation uh, which follows, it's been useful in thinking about skill knowledge and other kinds of non-explicit knowledge to come into play unconsciously when called forth by a situation. Now, Polanyi called this kind of knowledge tacit, and Lakoff and Johnson made a similar point in their 1999 book, Philosophy in the Flesh, when they stated that 90% of cognition is unconscious. Such a statement challenges notions that cognition is a process of conscious reasoning, which is one of the reasons why I want to bring into question the notion of higher cognition. Now, the, the Chilean biologists Maturana and Varela 
developed this, this notion of autopoiesis, or autopoietic biology. And in doing so, they countered a kind of internalist, mentalist conception of human exceptionalist approaches to cognition by proposing that in their paradigm, to live is to cognize. And they asserted this applies to all life forms, including bacteria. So they put cognition on a firmly non-human exceptionalist and biological basis. The first generation in activism arose directly out of out of poesis. And um, other, other key topic, key uh, uh, concepts that I've, I've uh, found useful, Kirsch's epistemic action, which I would also like to problematize, um, and also key works in, in, in distributed cognition, of course, Edward Hutchins' distributed cognition and also Lucy Suchman's situated cognition. More recently, uh, Ed Hutchins uh, developed a, this useful concept of cognitive ecology or cognitive ecologies, um, a, a concept that encompasses the heterogeneous combination of structured spaces, tools and instruments, procedures and skilled bodies that make up locations of specialized production, be it a carpenter's or jeweler's workshop, a theater, a library or a gymnasium. There's sympathy here, of course, with Pickering's dance of agency as well as actor network theory. And I would say that John Sutton and others have gone on to uh, deploy this concept of, of cognitive ecologies uh, in, in particularly in John's work in the studies of performance. Uh, now, I'm, I've, I've, I've identified some of these binaries, such as Ryle's know-how and know-that and Pickering's representational and performative and Kirsch's epistemic and pragmatic. And I, I want to say that um, I, don't, I don't think it's useful to regard these as oppositional binaries. I, I think that, um, that they should be thought of as, as fields of exchange uh, the interesting questions uh, are for me, how does know-how become know-that? How does the representational inform the performative? Are all real world, real world actions both epistemic and pragmatic? I'd argue that, you know, if you read Kirsch's work in one way, uh, the, the distinction between epistemic and pragmatic falls out of uh, the 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 demands of of experimental method, uh, but that's another conversation. So now I'll segue to to the conversation about the neurophysiology of skill. I've observed that a great deal of the writing on skill in philosophy, anthropology, sociology, even humanistic informatics, focuses on the capable person in a social context. Uh, they take a descriptive external view, speaking of skills being acquired, developed, passed on, occurring peri in peripersonal or intercorporeal or intersubjective space, or in a hybrid space of artifacts, environments, and agents. And I, I see a kind of yawning disciplinary discursive explanatory gap between these, should we say, anthropological and neuroscientific perspectives, between the biological and the social. Attempts to bridge these realms are few. I think of Merleau-Ponty and Oliver Sacks in, in different realms. It's interesting that this schism is a schism that came up in, in ethology uh, a couple of decades ago, uh, where where animal neuroscience and ethology were kind of speaking different languages and a, a, a kind of hybrid practice referred to as neuroethology emerged uh, to tr and try and address these issues. And I see now with the development of and the availability, increasing uh, uh, accessibility of some of these sophisticated neuroscientific technologies such as portable EEGs and so on, that we are at a similar moment with respect to uh, 
uh, studies of embodied cognition or, or can be. Um, so as useful and interesting as, as the kind of philosophical, sociological, anthropological work is, it seems seldom to address, and I'm happy to be informed if you know of sources, um, of what is involved in developing a skill in an embodied neurocognitive sense. That is, it does not offer answers to the question, as I develop a capability, what changes in me? This apparently is the purview of neuroscience, but experimental research in mainstream neuroscience usually focuses at the molecular and cellular levels, receptor sites and action potentials. Only in emerging fields of, emerging fields of network neuroscience and social neuroscience does one find attempts to build a bridge between behavior at the cellular level and behavior at the uh, social level uh, I'm thinking, uh, of course, of the work of Vittorio Galesi and his colleagues in Parma. So in what follows, I want to touch on two different aspects of, of neuroscience that I think are relevant to pursuing a non-dualist neurophysiology. The first is the phylogenetic perspective. Examination of the forms of neural structures in the brains and spinal cords of different species in relation to the physical form and sensory and motor capabilities provides a way to understand human neurophysiology and behavioral capacities holistically via an evolutionary lens. And this, in this work, uh, uh, Paul Chisek and, and Luis Pessoa uh, uh, are sort of leading uh, my leading. So a, a phylogenetically informed neuroscience is a useful way to understand human neurophysiology that sheds light on the relationships between neuroanatomy and behaviors and processes, including cognitive processes. Traditional conception of mind, cognition, and faculty psychology were inherently unscientific, both due to the non-existence of relevant scientific methods and the ontological snookering of the Cartesian dualism. What I mean by that is that is that is that philosophy of mind was essentially prohibited from engaging science. Um, historically, neurology was restricted to inferences based on the observations of brain injured individuals and the gross anatomical interventions in mice, rats, cats, monkeys, and rabbits. The development of the theory of genetic evolution, we must recall, emerged only in the mid 1800s and only gained acceptance a few decades later. It was not until the 1970s that evolutionary developmental biology, Evo Devo, became technically viable. A fundamental principle of evolutionary developmental biology is that evolutionary development is recapitulated in the development of the embryo. It's a common place that both chicken and human embryos have gill slits, demonstrating that both have common ancestors in fish. And this, of course, gives credence to a kind of phylogenetic uh, perspective. We now readily accept that we share 98.8% of our genome with chimpanzees, roughly 85% with mice, and around 75% of the genes which are known to cause illness in humans also occur in flies. Similarly, all multicellular animals share the vast majority of proteins, enzymes, and amino acids. Neurotransmitters, nitric oxide, ATP, glutamate, and others are shared with the evolutionarily primitive placozoa, acetylcholine, dopamine, noradrenaline, octopamine, serotonin, and histamine are found in all bilaterians. Now, bilaterians refers to animals with a bilateral symmetry and a one-way gut uh, with a mouth and an anus, like worms. And they evolutionarily, they, pre they precede the uh, emergence of bones, limbs, spinal cords, eyes, and so on. So you can see that at a kind of um, uh, biological level uh, there's a really a, a strong argument for this kind of phylogenetic perspective. From an evolutionary point of view, neural tissue, 
of humans and other animals, including simple chordates and even simpler animals, serve spatially and temporally coordinative purposes prior to any kind of awareness or conscious behavior. In the original case, as in sea urchins, neural tissue emerges first in the gut for coordination of digestion. The fundamental process of complex animals, the absorption of metabolically useful chemicals that originate beyond the organism itself and the complementary process of removal of waste. A neurobiological perspective on the brain is that its first and primary function is the coordination of systems, of sensory functions with actions and so on via multiple networks, endocrine, immune, neural, etc. As Schaffer et al. say, the brain's most important job is to efficiently coordinate and regulate the systems of its body as an animal moves and grows with an ever-changing and only partly predictable external world. Now, traditional philosophy of mind would have us believe that the brain grew a body as a plaything. The opposite is true. Evolutionarily, the body grew a brain, first to coordinate digestion, then to coordinate the relationship between sensing and locomotion. We have a brain because it helps us get by in the world. And this is why I really want, I maybe kind of draw this together now that I'm trying to reconfigure an understanding of skill, not as a kind of um, uh, side show to intelligence proper, but it is in fact center stage. The bits of gray matter at the top of the spinal column are presumably sucking up calories for some evolutionarily justifiable reason, and not just for talking about topics like this. The li I love this. The, li the life cycle of the tunicate, a marine organism, is instructive. The larval form is mobile. It swims. It is a chordate. It has a spinal column, a, a, sorry, a spinal cord, a simple brain, and an eye. But once it finds a good spot to spend its sedentary adult life, and thus no longer requires mobility, it promptly eats its own brain. <laughs> now, <clears throat> it's important also to recognize in terms of this kind of, you know, privileging of the brain and so on, that in human embryology, about the fourth week, the locus of neuro tissue, neural tissue, and it's called the neural plate, splits. About half of the embryonic neural tissue becomes the brain and spinal cord. The other half becomes the enteric nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. This is worth pausing on for a moment. Half the embryo's neural tissue is not in the CNS, the brain and spinal cord. The human gut has its own semi-autonomous neurology, a sheath of neuro tissue, neural tissue with its own blood-brain barrier. Gut feelings is more than a metaphor. We said it in English, I don't know. It's idiomatic expressions. So one upshot, uh, upshot of this work in phylogenetic neuroscience has been to destabilize traditional notions of, quote, mental faculties. And uh, so ideas such as memory, language, emotions, reasoning, the association of these with particular brain areas. Capacities that were thought to occur in specific brain areas appear to be significantly distributed and specific areas do combinations of things that seem incompatible with these kind of traditional faculty assumptions. Areas that were regarded as more or less uninteresting turn out to have greater significance. For instance, the hippocampus, can traditionally considered to be concerned with olfaction, plays roles in learning, memory encoding, memory consolidation, spatial navigation, and also in emotional processing, including anxiety and avoidance behaviors. This phylogenetic perspective is deeply relevant in considering skill as intelligence. Human neural tissue exists to support metabolism and movement. 
Cognition of the embodied kind, as I said, is not an odd backwater of cognition. The opposite is true. Evolutionarily speaking, language, culture, reason, consciousness, selfhood, higher cognition, and the delights of philosophy are late coming epiphenomena, you might say. Now, I'd like to segue to the last theme of my talk, uh, which is about proprioception, um, a word that didn't come up in in uh, Susanna's talk earlier. Now, what do we know or learn when we say lift a brick? We experience mass, the balance of the object in your grip, the force we have to apply to keep the grip, the way you adjust your arm position and stance to accommodate its mass, the posture you adopt to heave it. All these sensations arise inside, below the skin, deep in the muscles and joints. This is sensorimotoric inaction and autopoietic structural coupling at work. This is the kind of knowledge from which we can and do learn, but it's not propositional. There's a rough texture. The experience of texture has a temporality to it. You can only feel texture when there's movement. When the movement stops, texture stops. And in fact, vision is, is quite similar. All biological sensing is therefore in the temporal domain. Vision, touch, hearing, what we perceive are differences, deltas, changes through time. Sensing at this micro level always entails action, bearing out the inactive sensorimotor conception that uh, re rejects a sense act dualism. Now, other qualities of the brick, it's balance in your grip. As I said, the, um, the way you have to hold the grip. Um, these sensations arise inside, below the skin, deep in the muscles and joints. What aspects of embodiment do we access in order to, to develop skills in this area? What is happening here on the level of muscles and nerves? Any such achievement is rooted in neurophysiological capacity, the basic elements of which must be pre-existing. This pre-existing system is proprioception. Proprioception is the forgotten internal fundamental sense. It tells us where our body parts are in relation to each other, how they are moving and the forces they are experiencing. It's the sense that permits us with our eyes closed to bring our fingertips close together in front of our noses. Now, we have around 600 muscles and of the order of 250 million afferent and efferent nerve endings in the proprioceptive system alone. By rough arithmetic, that's over 400,000 nerve endings per muscle. Even, this, even if this number is exaggerated by two orders of magnitude, that's an awful lot of information. And this, to come back to robotics for a moment, puts significant pressure on the aspirations of anthropomorphic robots because the, um, the, the, the shall we say, the proprioceptive capacity of, of anthropomorphic robots and robotics in general is 10 orders of magnitude less than we have as, uh, as biological beings. We would be profoundly disabled without proprioceptive and vestibular sensitivities and kinesthetic awarenesses, and neurological case studies attest to this. An adept pianist or cellist enacts gestures of musical performance with exquisite precision. Skilled tool use, the dexterity of the painter, musicianship, these all involve attuning subtle sensibilities of proprioception so that increasingly subtle judgments can be made. And on the basis of those judgments, more refined actions, which are themselves assessed on the basis of more refined judgments. Proprioceptive knowing is not conscious or not always conscious. It floats around on the verge between the conscious and the non-conscious. Proprioceptive knowing is, or at least contributes to this concept of pre-reflective awareness. 
pre-reflective awareness is the awareness we have before consciousness tells a story about it. One knows in an incontrovertible way that one has, for instance, taken a step forward or opened the door. This kind of knowing is fundamental to our very existence. It keeps us safe, for instance, when we step on loose gravel on a hillside and risk slipping down. Notice that we can make both willed and unwilled bodily actions. We can kick a ball, but we can also walk without conscious attention while conversing with a walking partner until or unless something unexpected happens. Often when we walk, we're entirely unaware of how we move our legs or feet. Even if the surface changes, say from concrete to grass, we, must may, we may just go on chatting oblivious. I'll get back to that thought in a minute, but I just want to segue to an idea about the relationship between such embodied experiences and what we might call higher cognition. So I would argue, as others would, Lakoff and Johnson and so on, um, so that such experience provides a fundamental basis for, of resources for higher cognition, often in the form of metaphors. We know that our language is replete with images from artisanal and technical work, from very general concepts like building a theory, walling off a topic, undermining an argument, or providing a foundation, to specifics based in artisanal practices like sailing, blacksmithing, carpentry, or weaving. You can't go against the grain if you don't know what grain is. A glancing blow pertains to hammering a hard material. You can't apply, deploy metaphors of warp and weft if you don't understand weaving. We can only make sense of expressions like being steamed up or taking a different tack or going at it hammer and tongs if we understand the source domains. And yes, these days we can have too many tabs open. Now, proprioception is an internal self-referential sense, different in quality from the outward-facing five classical senses. And we can talk about vestibular sense and graviception and other kind of uh, uh, embodied senses. But notice that we have a sophisticated vocabulary for the visual, for the auditory, and for the olfactory, but in Western culture, we generally have a more limited language for body awareness, bodily awarenesses outside of the vocabularies for specialized body practices, such as yoga, tai chi, dance, Feldenkrais, martial arts. Right? Most people cannot speak of embody, embodied awarenesses with much precision, unless they're trained in these practices. Proprioception, interestingly, doesn't even figure in the classical canon of the five senses. So there's no, it's no wonder that we have no vocabulary for it. While the five classical senses all look outward beyond the body, or at least at the surfaces where the body interacts with the world, proprioception is importantly inner, distributed throughout, and it distributed throughout the entire musculoskeletal system. Proprioception and its fundamental role in awareness and experience has been ignored in conventional philosophy of mind and perceptual psychology, in my opinion. I'm increasingly persuaded that it is fundamental to all action and sensing. Proprioception is the sense that coordinates and calibrates all the other senses and actions. Proprioception is the sense that provides the scaffold upon which the other senses hang. It is the cognitive glue that allows us to make sense of the world. Proprioception is the sense that makes the other senses make sense. The five senses can only make sense when contextualized inside this proprioceptive net. I know the thing I am seeing in, is in front of me because my neck is not bent to the left or the right. Because I know my arm is extended, I'm able to pull it back when I feel the pain of the too hot surface on my fingers. Proprioception calibrates vision. Piaget showed that when a newborn infant comes into vision, comes to see, in part by flailing their limbs about, hitting some things and not others, 
This provides a deictic body scale depth perception. The seen object is within arm's reach or it's not. And the classic kittens in baskets experiment of Heinen and Held showed similar. The kitten that could walk developed normally. The kitten that rode around in the basket was functionally blind. Moving visual patterns and optic flow remain meaningless unless calibrated by proprioception. There's no vision without ocular motor changes, saccades, and without the awareness of the position of the head. Keep your head still and look hard to the left as if tracking something to the left. Feel as your eyeball moves to its leftward limit that the neck muscles instantly come into action to continue the pan as it were. It's as if your eyeballs pull your head around. Vision is, is, an, act, is an activity of the whole head, if not of the whole body. Now, I want to turn to proprioceptive learning, the question of proprioceptive learning. Uh, clearly, there are different contexts in which enskillment can occur. There are different kinds of trainings and pedagogies, class, classes and workshops and apprenticeships, instruction manuals and YouTube videos, and more autodidactic pursuits. But whatever the context of learning, experience is ultimately internal or peripersonally focused. Whether it's playing scales on the piano or riding a bicycle, you know when you get it right. You know how it feels to do it right. And as this rightness finesse develops, a more judicious and refined comprehension of the quality and degree of rightness also develops. That knowing, that discernment is evidence that you know. Expertise is evidenced in the discernment of expertise. What's that called? The Dunning-Kruger effect? I love that. We'll get on to that. Okay. Um, so here's my question. What happens from a neurophysiological perspective when we're in the process of acquiring or refining a skill? How is it on a sensory modal level that we become enskilled? What do we access? What develops? What does it mean neurophysiologically to cultivate an embodied capability? A central aspect of the acquisition of skills must be the education of proprioception. But what exactly is going on at a neurophysiological level when one attends to sensations? For instance, the shape and strength of one grips on, say, the handle of a machete. When we're learning some skill, say, skating or tango dancing, we're able to, and we must, direct our attention to specificities of the bending of an ankle or the pointing of the toe in a new way. We develop refined awareness of aspects of our bodily movement that have previously remained automatic. What I'm interested in is what neural processes permit us to come to have conscious access to or feel we have conscious access to these deep proprioceptive sensory motoric processes. And I resist falling back on the all too easy story that awareness resides in the frontal lobes and the process of becoming conscious of implies somehow relaying sensations that are usually unconscious in the cranial basement and being brought up to the light of day in the, in the uh, mental drawing room, as it were. What is it that we are aware, are aware of? And through what mechanism do we gain that awareness? Five minutes? Five minutes? I think I can make it. Neil, yes, 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 I can, I can. Okay. <clears throat> when we strive to learn a new skill, part of the process of that is that we gain conscious access to sensations of proprioceptive innovation that is usually, normally not available to consciousness, to, to conscious awareness. 
with new conscious awareness of specific movements, we become able to move and sense and judge in new ways. And then this new capability subsides from consciousness to become an enhanced unconscious routine. Learning to ride a bicycle is challenging, but once you have it, you have it for your life for different bicycles and so on. There's attentive learning and there's also surprise. For instance, walking on a particular sandy creek bed, the sand has a predictable kind of softness and give to which one adjusts when you skate until a foot lands on a rock. Then all manner of compensation occurs to avoid a twisted ankle of which one is conscious. We enforce existing neural pathways and build new ones. This neuroplasticity occurs importantly, not only in the brain, perhaps not even mainly in the brain, certainly in the cerebellum, but also in the motor pools of the spinal cord, interacting directly and rapidly with the muscles and joints via afferent and efferent feedback loops. This work is sensory motor, deep within the proprioceptive system, because the motor pools behave semi-automatically, so semi-autonomously, with real-time feedback. But this brings us to a central question, which I think remains a mystery in neuroscience and which I find personally quite mysterious. What and where is, where does the quality of attention or awareness reside? Is it in the body proper? Is it in the, in the quality conjured by the mind brain? Or do we require a different non-dualist explanation that conceives of the organism as multiply integrated system? My intuition for a non-dualist neurophysiology begins with the conception that awareness is always already suffused in the body and available. This perhaps relieves the brain of the burden of motor representation. To paraphrase Rodney Brooks, the body is its own best model. Or as John Hoagland said, if we want to know what's in the fridge, we just go and look. Conclusion. What I hope to have communicated here is that conceiving of, our, of ourselves as composed of mind and body as separate parts is counterproductive in comprehending the nature of skill as intelligence. A non-dualist approach to neurophysiology provides a more balanced theoretical framework within which to discuss skill and or as cognition. Grounding non-dualist conception of skill in neuroscience is not simply an attempt to find scientific justification, but to draw upon diverse research in order to build an enriched understanding of skilled practices that will feel explanatory and productive for practitioners as well as theorists. A holistic conception of the organism is evolutionary justified. Skill is a capacity of the whole organism. If such capacities are of the whole organism immersed in its environment, then cognition and intelligence must also be understood as similarly situated in specific contexts or specific cognitive ecologies. This contingent and performative conception is counterposed to the predilection of academia for generalized knowledge in the representational idiom. Thank you so much.